Hello, I'm Dr. Julie Brown. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician, and this talk is for medical providers who are involved in the care of children presenting with suspected anaphylaxis. It is called when the bee stings, when the body swells, when it's anaphylaxis. We are going to cover the basic epidemiology and pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. We're going to focus mainly on clinical management, and we're going to talk a little bit about what to do after the reaction. I also want to acknowledge at this point all of the allergy families who have graciously shared their wonderful and very illustrative photographs with me um, that I think will really help with um, illustrating points during this talk, uh, including this wonderful image of a young man with food allergies who is soaring above the rooftops on his trapeze while um, demonstrating how to live life to the fullest while still carrying his auto injector on his belt on his waist. To begin, allergies suffer from some unfortunate name sharing. Um, between the environmental kind of allergy, the runny nose, sneezy, itchy eyes kind of allergy, and the life-threatening, stop-breathing, anaphylaxis-inducing kind of allergy. And you actually can see examples of both here in the same child. On the left, he has been exposed to horses, and on the right, he has eaten a food to which he has an anaphylactic allergy. And this unfortunate name sharing results in a lot of misunderstanding, both in the community and sometimes also um, amongst the medical community in, in a failure to recognize the potential severity of these reactions and the possibility of progression from what can be mild skin symptoms or superficial allergic type symptoms to life-threatening disease. And today we're going to focus only on this anaphylaxis type of allergy. There are 40 million people in the United States who have a life-threatening allergy. 15 million of them have a food allergy. 2 million have an insect venom allergy. Most of the rest of these allergies involve medications or latex. There are 60 million children in the United States who have food allergies. That's 8% of all children, or 1 in 13 children, or 2 in every classroom. Those are staggering statistics, and really very different from where we were 20 years ago, and nobody really understands why. 30% of these children with food allergies have multiple food allergies. The top eight food allergens in the United States are milk, eggs, wheat, and soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Those four on the left generally resolve in childhood. The four on the right are generally lifelong allergies. Only 20% of peanut allergies resolve, and 9% of tree nut allergies resolve. This graph gives you an idea of the relative incidence of these different allergies in childhood. And if you're a very careful observer, you will note that these numbers don't add up to 100 because people are allergic to more than one thing. And obviously, there are a lot of missing allergens from this graph farther down the, the way. The relative proportion of different allergies varies by age with the youngest children being most likely to be allergic to milk. Then peanut takes over in early childhood through at early adolescence, and shellfish being the most common allergen from late adolescence through adulthood. The mainstay of allergy treatment is avoidance, and this is very challenging, particularly in a country where there are a lot of challenges with how food is labeled. And it is most challenging when you are outside the home. So 15% of people with allergies have an allergic reaction each year, and more than half of these react outside the home where they have less control over label reading, over making sure that they're eating foods that they know don't contain their allergen. There are immunotherapies available, 
These are still in many cases investigational and not available for all allergens. They are time intensive. They take cooperation from a child who may have developed quite an aversion to eating that allergen and will have to unlearn that. They can be expensive. They can involve quite a lot of travel on the part of families. And they may involve multiple episodes of anaphylaxis along the way to um, developing desensitization to that allergen, um, which may be very um, unacceptable to some families. So they are not for everyone. And they are generally not a cure. You develop desensitization, not tolerance, meaning that you have to have continued ongoing exposure to that antigen at the end of therapy, or you can become allergic to it again. And that brings us to anaphylaxis. What is anaphylaxis? There are many definitions of anaphylaxis, but this is a good and simple one. Anaphylaxis is a serious immune or hypersensitivity reaction that is rapid in onset and can cause death. So here is a schematic of the immune response, and you may have seen something like this somewhere along the way, and we're going to try and break it down a little bit to um, make it a little bit less intimidating. So you start with an antigen, and usually we're talking about a foreign invader, like a bacteria, that has found its way into the bloodstream. And the first thing that happens is you have what's called an antigen-presenting cell. And that cell has a very important job of presenting that antigen to the T cell, who otherwise can have a hard time recognizing it. And then the T cell's job is to sound the alarm, and the T cell releases all of these mediators that then bring in and recruit other cells to the scene. And the most important of these is the B cell. And the B cell is the primary antibody factory. So the B cell then gets all revved up and says, I, I can do it. I can take, I, I got it. I can respond to that. I can make some antibodies to that and spits out all these antibodies that are, that are going to then bind to this invader. And those antibodies then go and sit on the surface of predominantly mast cells, which are on the skin and which are also on a number of different organs, and also on basophils, which um, float around fr free in the bloodstream. And then when any of that antigen comes along, then that mast cell is locked and loaded and primed and ready to deal with that foreign invader. But what happens when that antigen, instead of being a foreigner, is actually something innocuous like a peanut? Well, then the B cell's made a mistake, and it's making an antibody to something it shouldn't, and now the mast cell is locked and loaded against this little innocuous peanut protein. And then, you know, the peanut protein comes along again, and it allows for this cross-linking between these antibodies sitting on the mast cell, which is locked and loaded, and boom, it releases all of these mediators of inflammation against this little innocuous piece of peanut protein resulting in this really big immune response. And that is your immediate hypersensitivity reaction. And then there's also these other pathways. So the T cell, when it sounded its alarm, releases other mediators, which actually rev up eosinophils and get them activated. And to a lesser extent, they also release granules, which do other things. And that's your late phase reaction. So that's your immune response in a nutshell, so to speak. And what do all those mediators do? Well, they act on all these different end organs, smooth muscle cells, small blood vessels, mucous glands, blood platelets, sensory nerve endings, and eosinophils. And what are these mediators? Well, the big player is histamine, and we talk about histamine a lot, but there actually are a whole lot of other mediators that are also important, particularly in hypotension, as it turns out, but also in a lot of the other aspects of the inflammatory response as well. So what are the tissue effects of these histamines? Well, in the cardiovascular system, they cause decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, vasodilation and leakage. In the respiratory system, bronchoconstriction, hypersecretion from glands. In the gastrointestinal system, smooth muscle contraction. In the neurological system, they're an excitatory neurotransmitter. In the skin, they cause separation between skin cells and increase permeability.
And this is one of the few times in the body where there's an actual positive feedback loop. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have an antigen acting on a mast cell and causing release of granules, the release of granules alone triggers the next mast cell without any further antigen exposure. And then that mast cell's um, released granules, those granules trigger the next mast cell, and so on, and so on. So one antigen exposure re results in this um, domino effect, poof, 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 and all these mast cells are exploding open. In addition to that, the mast cell and the, those mediators that are released feed back to the B cells, and the B cells will release more antibodies, so more mast cells are primed should any further antigen come along. So in both those ways, there's quite a powerful positive feedback loop. And that is such a rare thing to happen in the body where a, a, a small exposure could result in such a big response. It really speaks to the importance of getting on top of a foreign invader very quickly that the body would allow something like that to go on. And it really allows for a domino effect. So one tiny exposure just results in this really big response. And that is why a teeny tiny amount of an antigen can result in such a severe or lethal immune response. And that was nicely illustrated in this study by Pumphrey, where they looked at patients who had died from anaphylaxis and estimated the amount of the allergen that had been ingested. And in some cases, the amount of um, allergen when it was a peanut was as little as a milligram, which is one six hundredth of a peanut that had been ingested. And you can imagine how challenging that is for people with allergies to be living in a world where people without allergies are out doing just the normal thing of eating, living their lives, and leaving behind them residue of food proteins on countertops, on door handles, on playground equipment, and then the child with a food allergy comes behind them and touches that same surface and then maybe touches their face, their mouth, or their eye, and that small amount of protein is then ingested and results in a serious reaction. And if it seems hard to imagine that such a small amount of protein can cause such a severe reaction, imagine an insect sting and what a small amount of venom is injected under the skin and how severe those reactions can be. It's important to realize that past reactions don't predict future reactions. In an elegant study looking at people who had died from food reactions, the people who died typically had had mild previous reactions. And when they compared them in a couple of different ways to other patients at the same clinics they had visited, and received care, they found that they had very similar allergy severity scores and had had a similar number of prior clinic visits. So their past reactions were no different than those who had had non-lethal reactions. So you really can't say, I have mild food allergies. You should really say, I've had mild allergic reactions because anybody with food allergies is at risk for a lethal reaction. And that brings us to recognizing anaphylaxis. These symptoms of anaphylaxis, not surprisingly, mirror the tissue effects of antihistamines. So in the cardiovascular system, you have dizziness, tunnel vision, fainting. In the respiratory system, runny nose, and that one often doesn't get adequately recognized. It's often a sudden onset, severe runny nose, not just your little bit of underlying runny nose with a cold. Hoarse voice, tight throat, coughing, tight chest, wheezing. In the gastrointestinal system, vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain. In the skin, redness erith or erythema, hives and angioedema. In the central nervous system, anxiety or a feeling of doom. And yes, you can have anxiety because you know you're having an allergic reaction, but remember that there are also histamine-mediated direct effects on the central nervous system. So these could be true histamine uh, 
mediated symptoms of anaphylaxis. In particular, that feeling of doom, that sense of something really bad is happening, is a true is often a true symptom of anaphylaxis. Note that none of these are unique symptoms. All of these can also occur in other contexts. And so it is really putting together a constellation of symptoms that fit with the diagnosis of anaphylaxis or putting these symptoms in the context of an exposure that helps us come to the diagnosis. There are different kinds of rashes that we see in skin findings. Hives are these raised areas that are bigger than a little papular bump. They're described, described as raised plaques, um, which have a flat upper surface. They can be very variable in appearance, as you see here. They can be beefy red. They can be more flesh colored. They obviously have a variable appearance depending on the degree of pigmentation of the skin. The second rash you might see is this sunburn-like flushing, sometimes called erythema or erythroderma. Um, this rash often crops up very early in allergic reaction. And the severity of this, or the importance of this rash, is sometimes underestimated. But um, I find this rash is often a harbinger of more things to come since it's often a very early finding and this rash can really get my attention um, and sometimes in the right circumstance might get me to treat with epinephrine even before other symptoms have developed if I know that there's been a big exposure uh, because I think there's likely more coming. And then there's angioedema or edema um, which is an indication of inflammation at a deeper level of the dermis, this tends to get um, families more excited because it obviously looks a lot more impressive, although is not necessarily uh, a more concerning rash than the other rash we've looked at, unless, as seen on these images towards the right-hand side of your screen, it involves um, intraoral mucous membranes, and then, of course, we have concern that it might be progressing to uh, uh, obstruct an airway, and that is clearly of greater concern. And of course, we may see combinations and variations of this, these rashes. They don't always um, present in a pure form. Uh, you may see flushing with superimposed hives. Um, in the middle here, you see something that's kind of an, a tweener in between flushing and hives. On the right, you see um, some flushing along with some angioedema. So we see all kinds of variations uh, on that theme. While most people have a skin finding at some point during their allergic reaction, about 95% will develop it at some point in their course, only 60% have these as the first symptom, and only 62 to 72% have hives. So you have to be aware of all the other manifestations of allergic reactions, such as a child who presents with severe vomiting. In addition, the skin findings may be a very minor component of what is going on, as shown uh, with these two children, the one on the left had very mild skin changes, and within a few minutes of this presentation, um, he was complaining of uh, throat um, discomfort and then passed out. And the child on the right, at the same time as having these very mild hives on her face, was having uh, throat discomfort and cough and wheezing, and within 10 minutes of um, these findings was getting epinephrine. Kids have different ways of describing allergic reactions, and I'm going to highlight a few of these. They may describe food as spicy or like something's wrong with it. They may fe have a feeling like they have hair or something on their tongue and be trying to lick it off. They may talk about having bugs in their ears, and itching. They may talk about some visual disturbance, like their eyes going in and out. They may just have a vague sense of something being wrong, and they may not even be able to describe that. Allergists talk about 
kids doing food challenges in their office who will be happily playing and then they'll suddenly want to crawl up on their parents lap and they know to pay attention to that because that may be the beginning of something changing and they may suddenly not want to be walking but they may have a feeling like they're heavy or stuffy or hot which may be the blood pooling and a little bit of edema and they suddenly um, don't feel as comfortable walking around Timing can be really helpful in trying to tease out an allergic reaction because most happen in the first hour after an exposure. But you do have to keep in mind that 15% of people will have no exposure history. And there have been reports of allergic reactions that are delayed 10 hours or more from exposure. So you really do always have to keep an open mind. The time in patients who have died from allergic reactions, um, the time from exposure to death has varied by the type of exposure with iatrogenic exposure such as contrast dyes being the shortest with a median time of five minutes venom being next with 15 minutes and food being last with 30 minutes and you can see that there's quite a big range of um, time from exposure to death in those cases It is the short time from exposure to symptoms and the need to treat these symptoms promptly that necessitate families having a plan and having access to epinephrine at home. There are a couple good ones out there. I like this one from FAIR. I think it's nice and clear and visual. Um, they, it basically has two sections. One is severe symptoms, and if you have any of these severe symptoms, you should give epinephrine, and then mild symptoms, and if you have a combination of mild symptoms, you should give epinephrine. And notice that this is very conservative, that if you have many widespread hives over the body or widespread redness, you should give epinephrine. Or if you have repetitive vomiting or severe di diarrhea, you should give epinephrine. Well, I know as medical providers, we can think of many patients in our care who meet those criteria who are not in anaphylaxis. But remember that this is a care plan being given to a child with a food allergy. And you always want to err on the side of assuming it is anaphylaxis rather than that it isn't because epinephrine is a very safe drug and the risks of missing anaphylaxis are, are outweigh the risks of treating a reaction that is not anaphylaxis. So in the interest of keeping things simple, of not trying to tease out a two-day reaction to with hives that doesn't need epinephrine versus a 10-minute onset of diffuse hives that does, which would, all, would be too hard to spell out in a simple care plan, it, this just really errs on the side of caution and has a very low threshold for giving epinephrine. Um, the same if you look at the mild symptoms. These are pretty, um, you could think of lots of ways where these combinations might not be anaphylaxis. But again, the emphasis is on giving epinephrine when there's any potential because it is a safe thing to do and better to be safe than sorry. There's also a recently published care plan by the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's essentially pretty similar. It has this um, more severe um, symptom area. One notable difference is that it says if a child has any of these severe symptoms after eating the food or having a sting, give epinephrine. Well, that gets a little bit around the problem of, well, maybe these are due to something else, um, but it doesn't really address the 15% of people who may have no known exposure and doesn't really offer any um, guidance for that category. And I, I, I find that a little bit concerning to leave that group in limbo. Um, and then in the mild reaction category, it talks about monitoring the child if they have any of those things. It doesn't really uh, show in the care plan what to do if you have multiple of these mild symptoms. Although if you read the accompanying um, document about how to use this care plan, it says if more than one organ system is involved, then epinephrine is indicated. But that isn't translated all that clearly to the care plan itself, and I think that um, may lead to some confusion. So personally, I um, prefer the FAIR care plan, which I think is a little bit um, clearer and more straightforward for families. It also comes in English and Spanish, which I think is uh, an advantage.
But what about medical providers? What do we do in our setting where clearly this care plan was not designed with our needs in mind um, and where we can have a little bit more sophistication in how we incorporate time, vital signs, the sort of subtlety of the patient's presentation into our decisions around giving epinephrine. Well, the only validated tool that exists out there is the NIAID FAN, or sometimes called SAMHSA, assessment criteria. And these were intended as diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis, and they go as follows. Um, the, you can meet anaphylaxis criteria in one of these three following ways. Either you have an unknown exposure, but you have rash, and you have either respiratory compromise or hypotension. Or criterion two, you have a likely exposure, and you have any two of the following, rash, respiratory compromise, hypotension, or persistent GI symptoms. Or you have a known exposure and you're hypotensive. So this is very conservative in terms of making a diagnosis of anaphylaxis, kind of the flip side of what we just saw on that care plan, which is very conservative on giving epinephrine. This was not intended to be used by medical providers on the front line, seeing a patient early in an allergic reaction and trying to make a diagnostic decision about should this patient get epinephrine. Indeed, the people who, the committee who got together and developed these criteria themselves acknowledged that. They said, there will undoubtedly be patients who present with symptoms not yet fulfilling the criteria for anaphylaxis, yet in whom it would be appropriate to initiate therapy with epinephrine, such as the patient with a history of near-fatal anaphylaxis to peanut who ingested peanut and within minutes is experiencing urticaria and generalized flushing. So where does that leave us? It's the only validated assessment tool. It has been validated um, in studies looking at the entire patient visit and then how well the tool um, performs versus information gathered across the entire visit, not against the information that's available to the provider on presentation. And it's been said even by those who developed the tool that um, it may have some limitations in terms of its usefulness in real time. That was also uh, supported by a consensus statement of multidisciplinary experts who got together to work on emergency practice who said that although these criteria are helpful for research education and risk assessment by allergists, they are of limited value for emergency physicians at the onset of an anaphylactic event. Um, the criteria offer no guidance for identifying the patient with mild symptoms who may have impending anaphylaxis. This adds to the complexity of decision making around the use of epinephrine. So that really leaves us as emergency providers and frontline providers kind of struggling with what do we do in terms of trying to make good decisions um, in for the use of epinephrine, and how do we reconcile these very conservative uh, criteria with what families are doing on this very liberal use of epinephrine care plan? So I have spent uh, a year as a um, quality improvement scholar developing a tool that was designed to bridge that gap and um, determine determine for emergency providers a cutoff threshold where patients warranted epinephrine, focusing on the need for epinephrine rather than on um, whether or not they met strict di diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis. And I am going to um, show you in just a little bit um, the results of our um, clinical standard work anaphylaxis pathways, and you can see this tool um, in the appendices at the end of those pathways. And I'm also showing here um, a um, YouTube training video you can watch that talks you through um, the application of this tool. And that brings us to emergency management. So these mast cells are releasing all these mediators of inflammation. And it's kind of like a Pandora's box. And all these evils are being released into the bloodstream. And what do we do about them? 
So is it better to act on the end organs and try to block them from their actions at the end organs? Or is it better to try and stop the mast cells from releasing further mediators of inflammation? And of course, that's a trick question because the true answer is there's no way to really get on top of this reaction unless you do both those things together. And before I turn the page, I'm going to ask you to if you can think of any medication that can do both of those things. So just hazard a guess. What would you think might be a medication that could do all of those things? Did you guess epinephrine? Because epinephrine is a wonder drug in anaphylaxis. It does all of those things. Yes, it stabilizes mast cells. That comes as a surprise to some people because it's not in the class of drugs that we call mast cell stabilizers. But it does have well-described mast cell stabilizing effects, it makes those mast cells less twitchy and less likely to release those granules. It also reverses all of the effects of those cytokines pretty nearly perfectly. So where those cytokines, those immune mediators, are causing vasodilation, it causes vasoconstriction. Where they're causing bronchoconstriction, it causes bronchodilation. Where they're causing smooth muscle contraction, it causes smooth muscle relaxation. Yes, they can increase or sometimes decrease the pulse, and it increases the pulse. That one's not quite perfect. Where they're decreasing blood pressure, it increases blood pressure. Where they tend to on overall worsen coronary perfusion, epinephrine overall increases coronary perfusion because even though it's a vasoconstrictor, its overall benefits on um, circulation are such that the net benefit is to improve coronary perfusion, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Its effects are also almost immediate. So this is almost a perfect drug for reversing this hypersensitivity response. And I just can't believe that that is happening by accident. You know, this is a drug that our body makes. This is adrenaline. And we think of adrenaline as the fight or flight drug. But I believe that it was also designed to have this important function in tamping down an allergic reaction that is getting out of control. Because if you remember, earlier on I talked about this being one of the few times in the body where we have something happening that is self-amplifying, where a little bit of a reaction can result in this enormous response. Well, we must also have designed some way in the body to turn that reaction off. And I believe we have epinephrine as that mechanism for, for putting a tamp down on that response when we needed it. And we can use that to our advantage to give extra epinephrine to really put the brakes on this reaction when we need to. And compare that to the effects of antihistamines. Well, they can block histamine H1 receptor mediated vasodilation, bronchoconstriction, and muscle contraction. Those are a subset of the mechanisms by which those cytokines are acting. And they don't have, in therapeutic doses, a, a, an appreciable effect on pulse or blood pressure. So they're really not doing anything nearly as impressive as epinephrine, and their onset of action is at a minimum 15 to 60 um, minutes. So they're not doing it in anything like the time frame we need. In fact, there have never been any good randomized trials, but there are no trials of anaphylaxis that have shown that any histamines do anything beyond um, treating rash in anaphylaxis. So epinephrine is the clear winner here. No question, epinephrine is a wonder drug. Unfortunately, epinephrine gets a bad rap. So here is epinephrine being used in the movie Pulp Fiction where John Travolta is a hitman and he is um, saving his boss's wife who's overdosed on heroin by injecting epinephrine into his heart, which of course we never do in any circumstance. And he brings her back to life um, using this sort of drug of last resort. Um, and here is Julia Roberts in the movie Flatliners, and she is um, trying to bring back Kiefer Sutherland, who has 
intentionally flatlined himself and they've tried all sorts of things that haven't worked. And she says, epi intracardial. And they say, no, Rachel, no. And she says, just do it. And of course they give it to him and he's re revived. And here's the boy next door and the uh, crazy guy um, is giving the, the neighbor a shot of an EpiPen because he's having an allergic reaction. And, you know, he's supposed to be using an EpiPen, but goodness knows what he's actually using. This looks like a trainer that someone has put a nail in um, compared to, you can see in the corner what an actual EpiPen would look like, where, of course, you don't see the needle unless you're actually injecting. Um, so the media in Hollywood like to have their fun, um, but it has implications for how epinephrine is perceived in the community and how it becomes this big deal and this big scary thing to do. And I don't think it's even just the community who gets influenced by that. I think it's even the medical community who gets impact by this portrayal. And then we also have this context for the use of epinephrine, because when we are using it intravenously in cardiac arrest, of course, it is the drug of last resort. And these are very dire circumstances. And so we have this natural association between epinephrine and very life-threatening, um, high mortality circumstances um, with high potential for arrhythmias, for bad outcomes. So it's very hard for us to dissociate epinephrine from this environment um, and what we're doing when we use it intramuscularly in anaphylaxis. But this is what epinephrine does in anaphylaxis. It takes a kid who looks like this and probably feels pretty miserable and makes them very quickly look like this. It is an incredibly safe drug in kids. There are no absolute contraindications to the use of epinephrine in anyone, and there have never been any serious adverse events reported in children. Most adverse events that have ever been reported are with overdose or with intravenous bolus use of epinephrine, which you should never do. There's nearly zero risk in children with right dose, right root, and I don't think you could say better than that or maybe even that with Tylenol. There's very low risk in adults with right dose, right root. The higher risk populations are the elderly, those with high blood pressure, those with a history of stroke, heart attack, ischemic heart disease. There are unknown risks in pregnancy, but even in those high risk populations, the recommendations are that the benefits generally outweigh the risks because the risks of stroke and heart attack in anaphylaxis with the impairment of circulation that happens with anaphylaxis are greater than the risks of giving epinephrine because of the improvement um, in circulation that goes along with giving the epinephrine. So in patients with ischemic heart disease, epinephrine is still better than no epinephrine because the net effect is to improve blood flow to the heart, including to the coronary vessels. Um, despite the vasoconstriction that epinephrine can cause because you otherwise have so much vasodilation and impaired venous return to the heart with anaphylaxis that that itself is, uh, puts the heart at risk or puts the brain at risk. Yes, of course, there are still side effects of epinephrine. It causes, you know, it's like a big hit of caffeine. So it causes palpitations, tachycardias. It can cause arrhythmias. It causes hypertension, headache, tremor, weakness, pallor, sweating, nausea, vomiting, nervousness, anxiety. It can cause angina, ischemia, and stroke. Those things are possible, which is why if you are normal and healthy, you should never just randomly inject yourself with epinephrine. I've heard a parent say, well, if my kid's going to have to do it someday, I'm going to try it and see what it feels like. No, bad idea. Um, you should not, as an allergist, demonstrate to your patients what it's like to use an auto-injector. Bad idea, because maybe you're going to be that crazy outlier person who had some area of impaired circulation, and you're going to cause yourself some vasoconstriction and have a bad event. And, you know, God forbid that happens when you didn't need epinephrine. You're also starting from normal and putting yourself up above normal, whereas when you're in anaphylaxis, you're starting from below normal in terms of things like... 
blood pressure and putting yourself back to normal. So um, yes, it has side effects that um, need to be treated with respect, but yes, it is an extremely safe medication. So you should use epi first, epi fast. You don't want to wait until you're falling off the cliff because once things are bad, it is extremely difficult to make them better. You want to be treating them before they get bad. You can repeat it every five minutes as needed and lots of guidelines say that can be sooner if clinically warranted. So if you have a patient who's really in substantial respiratory distress um, and you're three minutes out and you're standing there with the next dose saying, looking at your clock saying, well, I'm not at five minutes yet. Go ahead, give that next dose. Um, but if you um, are not in that kind of a situation, it's reasonable to wait five minutes, let that drug take full effect before you decide on um, whether or not another dose is needed. Delayed uh, administration of epinephrine is associated with more use of epinephrine in total, longer emergency department stays, greater chances of admission, and increased risk of poor outcomes and death. Here's one study looking at um, emergency department course. They looked at nearly 1,000 kids with anaphylaxis treated over four years. Most of them had received um, at, uh, at least one dose of epinephrine, and 5% received um, two or more doses of epinephrine. Children had four times the odds of receiving two or more doses of epinephrine if they didn't receive it prior to hospital arrival. And it just really speaks to the importance of early epinephrine and also the importance of empowering your families to treat their allergic symptoms at home before coming to the hospital. There are also a number of studies that have shown that there are uh, is a decreased risk of biphasic reactions if you have treated with epinephrine early on. And here are three of them. There's one that has sort of a mixed um, adult and pediatric study, um, one of nearly 500 pediatric visits and one of about 100 pediatric uh, visits. And they all had slightly different outcomes, but they all showed a decreased risk of biphasic reactions based on early epinephrine use. Where do you give epinephrine? You want to give it in the lateral thigh between the upper and middle thirds of the lateral thigh. You're aiming for this big vastus lateralis muscle in the lateral thigh. So there are some examples with different auto injectors of where that would be. In a baby, it's the same place. If you're giving in a 0.15 milligram auto injector to someone who's less than 15 kilos, you can bunch up the thigh a little bit as shown here to kind of increase your depth of muscle before bone. And why do we give it in the lateral thigh? If you look at CDC recommendations for intramuscular injections, we mostly give injections to patients over age two in the deltoid muscle. So why do we give this in the thigh? Well, that is based on two studies, principally this study of 13 healthy adult men. And these men came into clinics on different days, and they were randomized to get an epinephrine injection either in the thigh or in the deltoid, um, and then they looked at plasma and epinephrine levels. And when they got either an EpiPen or a syringe and needle injection in the muscle of the thigh, which are the orange and yellow arrows here, they had a nice peak in epinephrine concentration. But when they had an injection either subcutaneously or in the muscle of the arm, their plasma epinephrine level was barely above placebo. So based on this very compelling result in a very small number of subjects um, and one other small pediatric study, um, all guidelines recommend that epinephrine always be given in the lateral thigh. So that's why it's given intramuscularly, works better than subcutaneously. Um, inhaled seems to work quite well, but it hasn't been proven to work as well as intramuscularly. And it should be given with a one inch needle or longer. In large um, uh, obese adults, it probably needs to be, or ideally should be longer than one inch. For positioning, the supine position is preferred. You can raise the legs. You can turn the patient to their side if they're vomiting. 
It should be their left side if they're pregnant. Um, and uh, you should let them sit up if they're having trouble breathing to be in a position of ideal breathing comfort. But what you don't want to do is let them stand up or let them have rapid um, changes to a more vertical position. And we're going to talk about that more in a second. Uh, you, can, you should also be giving them oxygen if that's available to you, um, if oxygen levels are low or until they are measured. You can add albuterol on top of epinephrine if they're wheezing, and you should give IV fluids if you are in shock. All other medications can wait, and I can't emphasize that enough. None of the other medications are important initial management medications in anaphylaxis. These are the things that matter. Epinephrine matters, and these supportive treatments matter. IV fluids are important for shock because you can lose up to 35% of circulating blood volume in less than 10 minutes. Patients in anaphylaxis should not be walking around. Here's a, a patient with anaphylaxis who is being walked to the emergency vehicle to be taken to the hospital. And once she got settled in this ambulance, she started vomiting. And who knows if that would have happened anyway, or if the additional stress of being walked there worsened her symptoms. But this is not a safe thing to do. The impairment of venous return when you stand up can be significant. And there's something called empty vena cava syndrome, where a rapid movement from lying down or sitting to standing can result in such pooling of your blood and such um, poor venous return that you can actually go into cardiac arrest and die. So I know this is a challenge for people who work in community settings, like in schools, about how do you get um, someone to care, but you should really be thoughtful uh, for someone who's having a significant reaction about whether or not they are safe to um, ambulate, even to the nurse's office. And someone having an allergic reaction should never be left to travel alone. I do want to say, however, that this is an, a safe way to travel. Um, EMS providers will often put a young child in a car seat um, to transport them safely on their stretcher, and I think that's um, perfectly fine if the patient is comfortable in that position. Biphasic reactions. A biphasic reaction is when the reaction improves and then has a second wave where it gets worse again. This has been reported in 1 to 20% of anaphylaxis overall and in 15% of pediatric anaphylaxis. Here's an example. This patient had onset of rash eight hours after an exposure, so quite late after an exposure. He received epinephrine and went to the emergency department where he was observed for four hours. Here's a picture of him looking great and his skin is nice and clear four hours after epinephrine. He went home, he went to bed, he woke up the next morning with a, turn, a return of the same rash and um, other symptoms of anaphylaxis as well. He got more epinephrine, had to go back to the hospital for more treatment. The biphasic reaction can be less severe, as severe, or more severe than the initial reaction. Up to 25% of fatal and near-fatal food reactions were biphasic reactions. And the reason for this is unclear, but it may be that it comes at a less expected time uh, removed from the food exposure. Most occur within 10 hours, but they've been reported up to 72 hours from the initial reaction. So here's a child who's getting epinephrine for his initial reaction, and 15 minutes later, he looks like a peach. So what do you do now? Well, the answer is you transport because of that risk of biphasic reaction. So anaphylaxis means they need to get emergently to the hospital. Anaphylaxis and got epinephrine still means they need to get emergently transported to the hospital. And it's the anaphylaxis and the risk of biphasic reaction, not the epinephrine, that necessitates that transport. So people have said, I didn't want to give epi because then I would have to call 911. Well, that is flawed logic. Now you're doubling your risk. The epinephrine makes you safer, so don't withhold it. If you don't give the epinephrine and don't call 911, well, now you are doubling your risk. 
you're not treating your symptoms and you're not getting yourself to care. All right, we are 49 minutes into this talk and we are just starting to talk about antihistamines. That is how unimportant antihistamines are in the management of anaphylaxis. And if I want you to take home anything today, it is to focus on treatment with epinephrine and think way down the road about adding an antihistamine. An antihistamine is what you give so your patient doesn't itch while they die of anaphylaxis. That's where you should think about it in your management tree. Antihistamines are inverse agonists. So they stabilize the inactive form of the H1 receptor on mast cells and basophils. There are no randomized trials of their use in anaphylaxis. So we don't know for sure if they do anything at all, but we do know from existing evidence and from evidence from cohort studies that they seem to have very limited, if any, benefit. The first generation antihistamine that we are all the most familiar with is diphenhydramine, the oral form, um, brand name being Benadryl. This crosses the blood-brain barrier, so it is more sedating. It's the only form that's available intravenously, and intravenous use, importantly, can cause hypotension. So you might be left not being sure if you have hypotension from the anaphylaxis itself or from your treatment. So something to think about. The second generation, there are many. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about today is cetirizine or Zyrtec because this is the one with the shortest onset of action. It crosses the blood-brain ba barrier less and is therefore less sedating. So if you compare the onset of action of these two drugs, it's actually similar. Um, cetirizine has a much longer duration of action, but it is less sedating and the extent of sedation is less, as you can see there. The two drugs have a similar time to resolution of hives and a similar time to resolution of, of itching. And cetirizine also has less uh, side effects, less anticholinergic effects. So it seems like it makes good sense in a patient that you're monitoring for symptoms of anaphylaxis to give them a drug that doesn't put them to sleep because then you're going to be left wondering, are they sleeping because they're having blood pressure or circulatory issues, or are they sleeping because of the medication I gave them? So in our emergency department, we have switched from using diphenhydramine to using cetirizine, and when, unless we absolutely feel it is necessary to give a patient, a patient an intravenous dose of medication. Now, 15% of mast cell H receptors are H2 receptors. So if you want to get all, maximize your effect on histamine receptors, you're going to have to use both H1 blockers and H2 blockers. And your H2 blockers are things like ranitidine, famotidine, somatidine. In our institution, we use ranitidine most commonly. Sometimes we use famotidine. Um, and studies have shown that H1 and H2 blockers used together to treat allergic symptoms, not just anaphylaxis, but sort of combined ER presentation of allergic disease, work more effectively than H1 blockers alone. And based on those studies and the, that theoretical knowledge we have about how uh, about mast cell receptors, um, we always treat our anaphylaxis patients with those two drugs together. So if we've made a decision to use an H1 blocker, we always add an H2 blocker, so we remember Zyrtec and Zantac. Corticosteroids, there are lots of different corticosteroids like prednisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone. In our, hosp in our emergency department, we're using dexamethasone. Um, these drugs take four to six hours to fully take effect, so they have no benefit, clearly, just based on that pathophysiology, their uh, pharmacokinetics on acute anaphylaxis. But the question is, could they help with protracted anaphylaxis? Could they help prevent biphasic events? Should we be getting them on board early for the potential benefit they have later? Well, the best way to answer that question, of course, would be a randomized trial where we put, ha you know, half of them get steroids, half of them don't get steroids. That would not be a hard study to do in anaphylaxis if we also gave them epinephrine appropriately, but that's never been done. 
So we don't really have good evidence for or against, unfortunately. What has been done is cohort studies where we look at whether or not they got steroids and then compare some kind of outcome. The problem with that, of course, is that the patients who got steroids may have been sicker than the patients who didn't get steroids. So then when we look at the outcomes, if the outcome is worse in the steroid group, well, then we might think, well, maybe they were sicker to begin with. So it always makes it very difficult to interpret the outcome. So, but there have, however, been many cohort studies, and they have been combined by doing a meta-analysis. So here's a meta-analysis, basically takes all of these studies and tries to put them together and get kind of a final result of, and uh, conclude something from um, a combined effect. Each of these studies has its own odds ratio, which are all those little dots, and its own confidence interval. And then we have a line um, we, we of no effect in the middle here, the uh, green line. And the, to the left favors the use of steroids, and to the right favors no steroids. And when we combine them, the combined odds ratio is the center of that diamond at the bottom, and the confidence interval are the edges of that diamond. And you can see that the confidence interval crosses that line of no effect, which means that the conclusion of that meta-analysis is that there is no evidence that steroids, this was looking at biphasic reactions, and there was no evidence that steroids prevent biphasic reactions. Dag nabbit, we didn't see any um, uh, good outcome from that study, but then, of course, people argue, well, maybe, again, it was because it was cohort studies, and maybe it was because the sicker patients got the steroids, so we're left still kind of wondering what to do about steroids. There's one more piece of evidence to consider, and that's a retrospective multi-center multi pediatric study that's based on EMR and billing data. It's a FIS study using this FIS database, and they showed some benefit in admitted patients in terms of decreased length of stay and decreased epinephrine use after the first day, and they saw no benefit in discharged patients. So looking at that paucity of evidence, why are corticosteroids still being used in discharged patients? Well, let's look at the pros and cons of this. Well, the, the people who are pro-steroids will say, as we've discussed, that cohort studies are pretty imperfect evidence and maybe haven't answered that question well. There are theoretical reasons why steroids might help. They seem to help in the sickest patients. That's some kind of suggestion they're doing something. And the absence of proof is not proof of absence. And then the people who are against using steroids say they shouldn't be. We should follow the evidence better. So we're kind of left in this quandary. And lots of guidelines have said, basically, it's up to you. You can use steroids or not as you see fit. So what do we do in our um, urgent care and emergency departments? We, after reviewing all these evidence, made the following decision. If we give a patient an anaphylaxis, epinephrine, and they immediately get better and have full resolution of their symptoms, we don't necessarily automatically give them steroids. But we do if they have any persistent symptoms after epinephrine, and we do if they have any um, anything that puts them in a higher risk category. And that includes a history of a biphasic reaction, a history of asthma or wheezing, or a delay of greater than an hour between exposure and symptom onset, because that has been identified as a risk factor for worsened outcomes. And then how long should we watch? So that also has very little evidence to guide it, but most guidelines recommend at least four hours of observation, and that should be from the latest of onset of symptoms, giving epinephrine, or any worsening of symptoms. And then there's often a um, description of indications for extend, extended observation, and those are things like severe reaction of slow onset, history of biphasic reaction, a marked asthmatic component, a slow response to treatment, an ingested antigen, although, of course, most of what we treat is an ingested antigen, um, and a long distance from care. If there's been no biphasic reaction by discharge, the chance of a reaction after that point is about 48% for the remainder of the 72 hours where biphasic reactions occur. So that's what you can tell families. You are not 100% out of the woods. And that's why it's important to leave with an auto injector in hand. But your chance of reaction over the next 68 hours is only 4%. So it is very small.
And here's an example of why observation is important. Here's a young girl who had significant improvement after epinephrine, and she's just relaxing. Um, uh, here she's an hour post-exposure, and then she had this significant flare just before discharge, four hours post-exposure. So all of what we've talked about here, we have put together. We did a very rigorous process of clinical standard work to um, review the evidence and develop pathways that we could use in our hospital. And you can find these um, following the link below or quite easily if you just Google search Seattle Children's and any of the following clinical standard work or anaphylaxis or pathways, you'll pop up with this page. You can actually see all of our pathways here, all of which are open to the public. Um, and, but if you click on anaphylaxis, then you'll see our anaphylaxis pathway. And you'll see that we have a whole series of parts to our pathway. It starts with patients with higher clinical concern, which really emphasizes giving epi and the early supportive measures we've talked about, the patients with lower clinical concern where you're not quite so sure and how we use our scoring tool to help us decide whether or not to give epi, and then how we manage patients with mild symptoms and how we decide whether or not to use antihistamines and steroids and how we monitor them, and then the sicker patients, what we do for them, um, and how we make management decisions, how we send them home, what we send them home with, how we make decisions around admission, what we do once they're in uh, inpatients, um, and some of how we manage them if they have a new onset of anaphylaxis. Wow. And that brings us to the last bit of this talk, which is what we do after the reaction. There are four key aspects to post-anaphylaxis care. The first is that your families have to know how to recognize and manage a reaction. They have to know how to avoid their allergens. They have to know how to use an epinephrine auto-injector. And they should all have a recommend recommendation to see an allergist. This is an important and potentially lifelong chronic medical condition that deserves to have the input from the medical expert in this specialty. This is a food allergy field guide, um, which is actually prepared free by the Food Allergy Research and Education Organization. They will send these to you on request, and we actually hand these out in our emergency department. They're fantastic. You can actually download them as well um, online, the, all the content. And they include lots of great information. They have the care plan in them. Um, they have how to get started, how to label read, lots of great information that is otherwise pretty challenging to share um, during, for us during an emergency department visit. There are three epinephrine auto-injectors available in the United States at present. There are two myelin products, the EpiPen and its generic, which really look um, pretty much identical. And there is the amnial lineage, lineage epinephrine, which is a generic for adrenoclic, even though um, you can't actually buy adrenoclic anymore. And there are the Kaleo AviQ products. There are differences between the devices in terms of shape and size and instructions for use. Um, notably, there are differences in hold time. There are differences in how you hold the devices. Um, and there's differences in needle protection. The Myelin device has a needle cover that comes down over it as you withdraw it from the leg. The Lineage device has no needle cover, and the AviQ has a true retracting needle that is gone in less than two seconds, retracts back up into the device. AviQ is the only um, auto-injector that has a dose for patients who weigh less than 15 kilos. It is FDA approved for 7.5 to 15 kilos um, and has a shorter ne needle than the 0.15 milligram device. It's available in the United States only and is not um, covered by all insurance, although it is available um, for low or zero cost to the consumer for most patients. Um, and then the 0.15 and 0.3 milligram devices um, are uh, made by all three companies. There is a new product that may come on the market soon. It's a generic for um, EpiPen and um, it's coming out 
by Teva Pharmaceuticals, and it will actually have its own instructions for use because it's enough different from EpiPen, including how it's held. Uh, and final words, just want to give a few words to um, that you can pass on to families dealing with food allergies. The first is don't be afraid to use epinephrine. Give it early to improve outcomes. Don't bank on the odds. And even though most kids in anaphylaxis will probably do well no matter what you do, and a lot of the time it will kind of burn out on its own, and you may get away with just giving Benadryl, you don't want to bank on those odds because you don't want to be the one where things took a sudden turn for the worse and went south. Don't make it bigger than it is. An EpiPen is a small injection. It does not have a big honk and nail in it. This is not a dire lat drug of last resort. And don't be afraid to live life. Prepare well, carry Epi always, and then go for it. You can do everything except eat your allergen. Thank you very much.